we have found one, a scientist or a science communicator with a strong name, Sean M. Elliott. It's the M that really drives it home. A science communicator and presenter who has worked for over a decade with groups such as CSIRO and, from the corner over there, Museum Victoria. <laughs> he, he currently runs Rough Science, which provides science presentations and activities to schools and community groups. He will, he will soon be moving to Scotland for six months to work on the Edinburgh Science Festival. But tonight, we have him here. Sean. Thank you. <laughs> Everybody needs a crotch microphone. <laughs> Can we uh, up the gain on this? No, sorry. Um, banjos. Just imagine going out there to Antarctica, spending all that time, the snow, the ice, being lost, being frozen, succumbing to frostbite and ailments, and somebody has a banjo. <laughs> I think I know who's getting eaten first. Um, it's interesting, Mel, uh, Mel's story takes place around about the same time as mine. I choose to start this story in 1915. And for this, I would like you to picture a little part of the world. It's called the Dardanelles. It's uh, in what we call today Turkey. And uh, we're going to zoom in on it to a little beach that we all know very well called Gallipoli. And on one side, we have emerging out of the ocean this army which is made up of, uh, of, of, of soldiers from different parts of the world. It's commanded largely by the British. There are Australians, there's New Zealanders, there's Canadians. On the other side, there's the Ottoman Empire and their soldiers. And one soldier in particular, right now, we have no idea what his name is, but he's likely to be around 20 in, in his 20s somewhere. He's currently cradling a rifle. It's a German rifle, a Mauser. It's got a, an eight millimeter caliber, caliber bullet in the chamber. And this bullet is just about to change the world. Except first, we're gonna rewind back about two years. It's 1913. And um, 1913, I want to put us to another part of the world, University of Manchester. And University of Manchester at this point of time has a physics department and the physics department is kind of at the cutting edge, no, 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 the bleeding edge of physics research at this time. If you were to walk through the University of Manchester's uh, physics department, you would see a roll call of all sorts of different names, Geiger after the Geiger counter, it, uh, the Geiger counter he invents in, at, at, in this laboratory. There's Chadwick, there's Rutherford. But in particular, I want to focus on a, a young man in his mid-twenties who arrives at Manchester University to do teaching under the tutelage of, of uh, Ernest Rutherford. And his name is Henry Mosley. Now, Mosley, uh, not to be confused with, there's another famous Mosley from England, Oswald Mosley, who was the head of the fascist party many years later, but not him, not even remotely related. That Mosley has one less E in his name. This Mosley, though, is a, an incredible experimentalist, or so we're about to find out. Um, just to, to paint a picture of physics at this point, there, one of the most incredible things that everybody's getting very excited about is x-rays because they'd been discovered a little time beforehand but they were actually starting to find out a bit more about the nature of x-rays and what you could do with them i mean there was that famous picture of uh, the, the guy he got his wife he got his uh, wife to put his hand down shot some x-rays through and onto some photographic paper and we get that that uh, picture of the bones from the hand with the wedding ring in place. But that wasn't the bit that was getting people excited. 
in, in the physics department at University of Manchester. It was some other things that, as I was starting to explore the nature of uh, x-rays, they were figuring out what they could actually do with them. And one of them was that if you set up a couple of slits in front of something that was emitting x-rays and put your uh, detector on the other side, some photographic paper, something that will bring up the x-rays as they interact with it, uh, you, you ended up with these various patterns because x-rays acting like a wave in this case w would end up leaving this kind of waveform pattern on, on, the, on the paper on the other side. And um, from this, and from this university, they figured out something which later became known as X-ray crystallography, which was basically, when you get some X-rays and you shoot it at stuff, and then you look at the pattern on the other side, and it turns out these X-rays are actually giving you a lot of detail about what's on the inside of this stuff. You see, visible light all around us here at the moment has a particular wavelength. And the wavelength of x-rays was much, much shorter. So it meant that if you shot visible light at something and you had that thing being much smaller than the actual wavelength of visible light, it meant you couldn't actually see it because it didn't interact. There's actually a really cool experiment you can try out when you go home tonight to actually look at this effect. And it's not with uh, visible light, it's with microwaves, which has a much larger wavelength. So go home tonight, uh, get yourself a nice, decent block of chocolate, around about that size or so. Go to your microwave, take out the tray. We don't want it spinning around. You put it inside, you hit go for you know 30 seconds on high. And when you hit stop, the chocolate Oh, yeah, incidentally, put the chocolate on the inside of the microwave while it's happening. And <laughs> you'll notice that there is melted spots here and there, and you can actually measure the wavelength of your own microwave by measuring the distance between these spots. Second experiment to try is you find yourself an ant and put it in the microwave, put it on 30 seconds on high. Don't worry, I've tried this. It's okay. It's, forget about the urban myths about things exploding in there. The ant will be fine. The ant is smaller than the wavelengths of microwaves. Don't do it with hamsters. <laughs> anyway, so x-rays were suddenly being discovered as being incredibly useful for, to, to uh, actually look at things that, that are uh, uh, much smaller than we could actually pick up with light. Let's just take a sideways step for a moment and think about elements. Because at this point, a lot was known about this, this, these things called elements. And um, by this stage, I, a, a certain thing that we now know as the periodic table of elements, it's kind of that iconic thing of science, the periodic table of elements. You, everybody can, as soon as I say that, I imagine most of you here will have a picture of what that looks like. This elegant table that, well, kind of elegant table. It's got these big bits at the bit, a little asterisk down here where all these ones here are meant to be stuck in there. And actually, the table's about this long, but they make it this long so it fits on page. At any rate, this table was starting to being, being formed. See, previous to this, the idea of elements, if we go right back to Plato, elements were easy. There were four of them. There was uh, air, earth, fire, wind, and if you grew up in the early 90s, heart. <laughs> and when you combine these, they called on Captain Planet. Captain Planet, he's a hero. Gonna take pollution down to zero. Gonna help him put asunder bad guys who like to loot and plunder. You'll pay for this, Captain Planet. I had a little bet with myself today that I wouldn't do that. I just lost and won. What were we talking about? <laughs> Elements. Oh, yeah, that's right. So, um, okay, fast forward several hundred years, and um, suddenly we've got more elements. In fact, today we have quite a lot more elements than just four. 
Uh, so if you've seen that cartoon show Avatar where the airbender can bend the four elements, imagine being able to bend 200 elements. You know, I'm currently pulling the iron out of your bloodstream. <laughs> the, um, uh, the first scientist who sort of tried doing this was a guy called Lavoisier who from France. And he had 30, 33 elements that he was trying to put into some kind of order. And he tried to order them saying, well, this one's a gas and this one's a metal. But the thing is, uh, gas and solid, that's their states of matter. And, and there are elements that can actually be a solid and a gas. So it didn't quite work out. Fast forward much further, we had a Russian called Mendeleev. And he figured out a different way to order them into a table. And he was a chemist. And chemists, uh, by nature, were looking at these elements and they had figured out quite a lot. They had actually been able to break down these elements quite a long way. And one thing they had been able to break, break it down to was that they were able to look at the atomic weight of the element, which was essentially, you know, um, having a, a lot more information about the very atoms that the element is made out of. Thing is, though, a lot of elements have very similar atomic weights, and to try and figure out these atomic weights, they're, they're, it's quite difficult. You have various amounts of titrations and, and uh, uh, reactions, distillations, filtrations, compositions, decompositions. I'm just making up chemistry-sounding words at this point. I'm not a chemist. Any chemists in the audience? Oh, good. <laughs> Filtrations, titrations, uh, uh, tatsalotations, I don't know. Anyway, there, there was only a certain amount of, of work that you could actually get to, to get these atomic weights. And Mendeleev uh, was one of these chemists who at the time were playing around with this additional notion. Let's not go with atomic weights, let's go with atomic numbers. And at this point, it, was very, it became very hand wavy. What was an atomic number? Yeah, really it came down to the chemist's own intuition as to what one element's uh, atomic number was compared to a, another element. Now at this point we come back to Mosley, who is working in his lab in uh, University of Manchester, and he started shooting x-rays at elements. And one thing that he noticed was that when he did this, the uh, the, the wavelength of the x-rays as it passed through the elements would diffract. And it would diffract depending on the element in different ways. In fact, it was a very ordered way. It was a very structured way. And what he figured out was that these atomic numbers actually did refer to something. At the time, the, the, um, the model of the atom the, the current one that was being thrown around a little bit, uh, it was actually a competition between two. There was Rutherford's model of the atom, which was this, it was this kind of round thing with this positive center thing and this negative stuff going around the outside. And then you had the Niels Bohr atom, which was, we had this nucleus, which was positive, and we had these electron orbitals around the outside. Now, even that still had its own issues, like how do the electrons stay there? Why don't they whiz off away from this positive thing? That sort of stuff. But it still worked. And so with that model in mind, Henry Mosley was there looking at these atoms, and he figured out that if there were positive particles inside this, uh, inside this nucleus, then this atomic number referred to the amount of positive particles inside this nucleus. And so he did it for hydrogen, and it comes up with one. He did it for helium, it comes up with two. And beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. Fluoride. Yeah, help me out, fluoride. Uh, um, um, keep, keep going, fluoride. Uh, uh, what, what's next, what's next? Neon, neon. Um, actually, I've got them written down here, really. I mean, uh, sodium, magnesium, aluminium. We could go on. But he started to build up the table using this particular method. And it was because he was a very precise experimentalist and um, was very precise in, in, in his experimentation and built up what was to become what we now know as the modern day periodic table as per atomic numbers. Um, now, the really cool thing about this was that there were some gaps as he did this, he went, hang on a second, I don't have anything for 
this part and I don't have anything for this part, I predict sometime in the future we will find elements to go in these parts here, which of course did happen. Eventually down the track, elements were discovered that fit, fit into these uh, missing blank parts. So he had a, a, an amazing career stretching out ahead of him. And this was 1914. 1914 was also the same year that uh, an archduke went for a, a drive with his wife and he and his wife got shot and uh, after a series of incredibly unfortunate events, Europe descended into war and in 1915, Mosley was part of the Signal Corps on the beaches of Gallipoli and he was right at one moment standing up to, to uh, give an order over a telephone when that bullet that I mentioned before impacted with his head. This is uh, just one of those moments where a light is extinguished out of the world. And during World War I, so many lights were extinguished. So many stories were gone. And Henry Mosley and, and the periodic table is just one of those stories which I leave with here tonight. Thank you very much.